lesson, like the epistle from 1 John picks up where we left off last week. If you remember last week, we read Jesus with his disciples. This is what's called the final discourse, his final teaching. And he says to them, you are the vine, I am the vine, you are the branches, and my father is the vine keeper. We pick up at verse 9 in chapter 15 of John's Gospel now. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you, though, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. The word of God for the people of God Thanks be to God. A newly married young couple was preparing their first family dinner for both sides of the family. It happened to be Easter dinner, and they were going to get ready to put the ham in the oven, and the wife gets out a knife and starts to cut the ham, and the husband says, wait, what are you doing? And she said, you have to cut the end off the ham. And he said, that's crazy. Why would you do that? And she said, that's how you cook the ham. You cut the end off. Well, they were about to get into a squabble, so he decided to go to the other room, and he called his mother, and he said, she's cutting the end off the ham. Have you ever heard of that? And his mother said, no, never heard of anything like that. That sounds a little weird. But she said to him, just let her do it. You know, it's not going to hurt anything, I guess. So he went in, and she had cut the end off the ham, and the ham was baking, and she wrapped the end and put it in the refrigerator. And later, when everyone was sitting at the table, and her mother was there, and his mother was there, he said, I can't stand it any longer. I have to know. He looked at his new mother-in-law and he said to her, why in the world did she cut the end off the ham? And she said, what do you mean cut the end off the ham? And he said, do you cut the end off the ham before you bake it every time? And she said, yes. And he said, why? And she said, because it doesn't fit in my pan. Children don't always learn by what we tell them, do they? They learn by what they watch, what they see. I know that's a corny old joke, but it still works very well in this one. Children learn what they see because teaching doesn't always happen in a classroom, and teaching doesn't happen when you sit down to your kids and say, this is what I want you to do. They learn from watching you. They learn how to love from watching your love toward them and toward others. Unfortunately, the opposite is true as well. If you've seen the Rodgers and Hammerstein musical, South Pacific, there's a little song that happens when, it's a story about, it's a story about racism, actually. It's about people who think they can't love someone because of who they are and where they're from and the color of their skin. And Nellie Forbush, who is the nurse that the musical is about, says, I can't help it. This is what I was taught. And the young man, the lieutenant, who's not going to survive the battle that he goes into, says to her, yes, you can. You can do things differently. And he sings this song. You've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be drummed in your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught to be afraid of people whose eyes are oddly made and people whose skin is a different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight, to hate all the people your relatives hate. You've got to be carefully taught. We love because God first loved us. What powerful words those are. We know love because we have been loved. We know forgiveness because we've been forgiven. We know grace because grace has been shown to us. We know how to do those things because those things have been ingrained in us from the beginning. 
There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears does not reach perfection in love. I've told you before that United Methodist pastors, before we're ordained, are asked questions in front of the entire annual conference session. We're asked, are you going on to perfection? We have to say, yes, with the help of God. Then the next question, do you expect to be made perfect in love in this life? And then you have to say, with God's help, yes. I, I've told this story so many times, and I'm sure I've told it to some of you here, but Bishop Joseph Yakel, who was the bishop who ordained me, was one of the first bishops of the United Methodist Church in 1968. He was consecrated when he was only in his 40s. He was one of the longest serving bishops, and he's still, God bless us, alive in his 90s. He came from the Evangelical United Brethren side of the family, and these are the words John Wesley had pastors agree to before they could be ordained. And he said, do we expect to be made perfect in love in this life? Are you going on to perfection? What? Are they crazy? And then he said he stopped and thought, well, if we're not going on to perfection, where in hell are we going? If we're not expecting that God can make us perfect in love, if God cannot change our hearts to God's way from the way of the world, where in hell are we going? Not using that facetiously in any sense of the word. I did not grow up in a very tolerant era. I was alive in the 1960s. I was alive in the 1950s, for that matter. But in the 1960s, when there was great racial discord in the country, I didn't grow up in a church that was very racially unbiased as well. When I was in the youth group, we asked our youth leader, we wanted to go to Hershey Park. Everybody at this youth group was white. And our leader said, we cannot go to Hershey Park. No, not going to go there. And I said, why not? He said, because there are too many. And he used the N-word there. And too often people tell me, well, you don't know what the life I lived growing up. You don't know the things I was taught. I was taught those things, too. I was taught to make distinctions between people. I was taught that you love people who are like you. I was taught you love people who do well and good things toward you. I was taught the other people you had to fear and you had to avoid. That was what the world tried to teach me, but I had parents who took me to church and I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ commanding me to love, commanding me to open my heart toward all people. That was the lesson that I chose to learn from, not the other. And my question for us is always, what are we teaching those who come behind us? Not necessarily by our words, but by our actions, by our fear. That was the epistle of John, the perfect love casts out fear. By the way, that was the lesson I read at my wedding, because I got married when I was 42. And talk about being afraid. Talk about needing God to help you get rid of the fear when you've lived by yourself for all those years and suddenly you're going to share your life with someone else. That was the lesson I chose, and people sort of laughed when that one came up. But I also wanted the part that says, those who say I love God or hate their brothers and sisters are liars, for those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Love isn't a feeling, it's a decision. It's an action, and it's a commandment of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He has his disciples together for one last time to teach them. What does he say? I want you to love one another. The only way they will know you are my disciples is if you have love and you show love for one another. And greater love, Jesus says in that final discourse from the gospel, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Sometimes sermon illustrations present themselves in the strangest ways. Anyone here heard of Jonathan Bauer? He is famous right now in the city of Ocean City, Maryland. He's the guy who jumped off the bridge to save the little girl. If you didn't hear about that, look it up. How many of you have driven over the bridge on Osselwoman Bay on Route 90 into Ocean City so many times? There are many accidents there. There was a several car pileup this week, and the accident was serious enough that for the first time in the experience of all the first responders, a pickup truck was pushed up onto the railing and was hanging and teetering, 
And this man, Jonathan Bauer, was in the car with his 13-year-old daughter. He saw a car seat fly out the truck window. He got out and he looked into the water below. 25 or 30 feet below him, he saw a child's seat, and then next to it, a little girl floating on her back in a little pink dress. And she flipped over and went under the water, and without thinking, he looked at his daughter and he said, tell the paramedics when they get here. He took off his shoes and he jumped in the water. He jumped in water that was 25 to 30 feet below where he was, water that was shallow enough that he could have hurt himself seriously. It did not stop him. And he picked up this little girl as she had gone under the water, and he held her. And another family in a pontoon boat saw what was happening, and they started toward him. And he handed them the baby, and he climbed into the boat. And by the time the paramedics got there and they took the baby away, they didn't know who it was who had saved him until people finally started to say, this is the man. And his car had been hit, too. It wasn't his child. He left his child behind to help someone else's. That's love. Love isn't a feeling. Now, there are different kinds of love in Greek. There's the love that you feel for your child when you see it for the first time. And unless you have postpartum depression, so I always like to put it in. The love that you feel for your grandchild the first time you see a grandchild. How many of you remember picking up your grandchild for the first time and saying, there has never been a more perfect thing in the world than this baby? I thought my kids were good. They're nothing compared to this one. This one is beautiful. This one is brilliant. This one is wonderful. One of my dearest friends in the ministry, when his first grandchild was born, he came to me at annual conference and he said, oh, you don't know how beautiful she is. I call her Ray Ray. She calls me Pop Pop. And I said, Bruce, she's six weeks old. She doesn't call you anything. And he said, she only says it when we're alone together. So this is the most perfect child I've ever seen. Whenever we're in the congregation, I say, does anyone have a joy? And there's a new grandparent, a first-time grandparent. They stand on the pew with their air horn, and they say, I have a baby, and it's beautiful and wonderful. That is not the kind of love we're talking about here. Maybe it's the love you felt for your sweetie pie the first time you saw each other. Maybe not this morning if you've been married for 30-some years or 40 years or whatever. But do you remember that time when your heart beat so fast and you... You never went out of the house without looking beautiful and wonderful, and you just could not stop smiling. When I met my husband, and we would talk from my office, my secretary said to me one day, does he know that this is not who he's marrying? Does, this, does he have any idea that this is not who you really are? I tell you what, I was in Sam's Club, and I, you know there are birds in Sam's Club that get in all the time? But I heard them singing, and I was singing with the birds, and I was so happy and wonderful. And she said, you're marrying this man under false pretenses. He doesn't know what you're really like. That in love feeling. That's not what this is. This is agape. This is the love that is an act of will. This is the, this is the love that God showed us in Jesus Christ. But God also shows us that family love, that filial love, the philia that we talked about a moment ago with your family. Because through Jesus Christ, we are the children of God. We are not just strangers anymore. We're not servants anymore. We're friends. We're the friends of Jesus Christ. There's a long explanation of what friendship meant in the Greco-Roman world of this time. I'm not going to unpack that for you. It's not Facebook. You're my friend if you send me a friend request. How many of you have friends on Facebook, people you never really even met or met maybe one time? but they met you and they want to friend you. No, we're talking a love that gives of itself no matter what the cause, no matter what happens. And sometimes it's hard to love people who are different than us. Sometimes it's hardest to love the people that we know the best, people who have the ability to hurt us or do us wrong on such a personal level that we don't think we can get over it. But we're called to get over it in the name of Jesus Christ. We love because God loved us. God loves each of you enough to send God's only Son into the world to take on your sin, your guilt, your shame, so that you won't know punishment, but you will know grace, that you will know a fresh start, you will know a new life in Him. But you're called to share that love with others, no matter what the cost, no matter who is the recipient of that love because it's God's command to us in Jesus Christ. Not God's suggestion, 
Uh, wouldn't it be a nice world if we all loved each other? Jesus said, this is my command that you love one another. This is how people will know that you belong to me by the love that you show others. Might seem impossible to do, but it's not because you are the child of God. Because God is working in and through you to reach out to others. All you have to do is let God direct your love, let God direct your interactions with others in the world, and let God direct how you will be. The book that I read, I've read before in churches. When we're inside, one time I read it and I put a tissue in every bullet, and people said, what's that for? And I said, you'll know when you get there. All at once, everyone sort of took out their tissue and started to wipe their eyes. Because it is a story. It's a little bit silly at times, isn't it? Someone wrote the, the corrected version of this story. Because he said it's creepy that this mother would go across town and invade her son's space. And he has the son stopping the mother at the window saying, you need to, you need to respect my boundaries, mother. And she goes back to her house. He says that's fixing the story. I don't think it fixes the story. I think it sort of ruins the story because it's not supposed to be a literal interpretation of what a mother's love is. But the story shows that no matter what her son does, whether he flushes her watch down the toilet, whether his friends are strange, whether she feels like she's in a zoo, whether he refuses to bathe when he's nine years old or not, she's going to love him. That is the love that God shows us. It's unconditional. It's unmerited. It's unearned but it's there. So today, go from this place to celebrate Mother's Day. It's a hard day for folks. It's a hard day for me. I was not able to have children. The reason Robert Munch wrote this book was because his wife had two stillbirths. And he wrote this book and the song, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby will be, was the song he sang to his stillborn children. He and his wife went on to adopt other children and to make the family together that they'd always wanted. But that's a choice to love. Some women don't come to church this day because they can't have children. Some people don't come to church because they had a mother who did not get it right. Some people don't come to church on this day because their hearts are aching for people so far away. And in this time of pandemic, so many people have been separated from their elderly parents. But go home and call who you need to call and remind each other of the love that you have. And if someone in your family has hurt you, forgive them. Not because they deserve it, but because this is who you are in Jesus Christ. God has given you the power to do all these things. Then go out into the world and love somebody like a mother. Go out and love other people like a mother. Love children, love adults. The people who are the hardest to love are often the people who need to be loved the hardest. And you have that ability in you. So go home singing, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, 